today. We are here with Dr. Gail Gazelle, author of three books, the most recent of which we will be talking about today, Mindful MD, Six Ways Mindfulness Restores Your Autonomy and Cures Healthcare Burnout. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Welcome back to The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On this week's episode, we have a guest host. So please be the same respectful audience you are for me and enjoy. Hello, welcome to Physician's Guide to Doctoring. We are your guest hosts, Jordan Feingold and Sanj Katyal. And we are here today with Dr. Gail Gazelle, MD, MCC, is a global expert on mindfulness and physician burnout, who has personally coached over 500 physicians from burnout to autonomy, presence, and fulfillment in their work. She is a part-time assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, master certified coach, mindfulness teacher, keynote speaker, and former hospice physician. Dr. Gazelle's wisdom, compassion, and expertise help those in healthcare and beyond bring mindfulness off of the meditation cushion and into their everyday lives and work so they can regain confidence, feel in control, and enjoy their lives and work. Dr. Gazelle is author of three books, Everyday Resilience, A Practical Guide to Build Inner Strength and Weather Life's Challenges, and Harvard's Health Guide, Mindfulness Support for Alzheimer's, Caregivers, and her most recent book, Mindful MD. You can find her at gailgazelle.com, and we are so delighted that she is joining us today. Welcome, Dr. Gazelle. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, such a pleasure to be here with you both. It's great to see you. And Sanj, how are you? I'm good. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Let's dive right in. And first, we want to talk about you, Dr. Gazelle, and your career and what you're up to these days. We know you trained as an internal medicine physician and were working as a hospice physician for many years. And the last decade, you transitioned to working with physicians. Tell us a little bit about how you decided to make this jump and this pivot in your career and what your day-to-day looks like now. Okay. Well, I'll try to give you the skinny on a long career. So yes, I trained in internal medicine, but my true love was end-of-life care. So that's the field that I rapidly moved into. And along the way, I had a child on my own as a single woman, and life was busy. I'm an academician at Harvard Medical School. I was doing solo parenting. I was trying to publish. I was trying to keep up with my hospice work. And it really started to wear me down. When I was home with my son, I felt guilty that I wasn't doing more for my patients. When I was at work, I felt guilty that I wasn't giving more attention to my son. And... I also kind of suffered from the imposter syndrome, I'll share that, and this sense that I was never, not just never doing enough, but never doing well enough. You know, this constant sense that I was falling short. Sure, my mind was comparing myself to other docs, telling me that they were smarter, that they were more articulate, that they were better, you know, educators and academicians, you name it. So I struggled with burnout, and I actually stumbled into coaching. And coaching was a complete game changer for me. It really helped me develop my authentic voice, my authentic presence, helped me get rid of a lot of that guilt that I just mentioned, helped me really work with a lot of self-limiting beliefs around not being good enough and always having to prove myself. So I pivoted in my career 13 years ago and became one of the first physicians to become a coach, a career coach four colleagues. So that's what I've done ever since. And I loved being a hospice doc and I absolutely love coaching colleagues from around North America. And so if we kind of fast forward a little bit, I've had the pleasure of coaching over 500 physicians and physician leaders over the last decade or so around burnout, leadership development, career transitions, you know, how do you navigate the mess of our current healthcare environments? So that's what I spend my time doing. And then I've always been very interested in mindfulness. I've had a longstanding meditation practice. And between 2017 and 2019, I took a in-depth mindfulness meditation teacher training. Mm -hmm. And really interesting, all the years that I was teaching at Harvard Medical School, I didn't learn that much about how to be a good educator. In that mindfulness meditation teacher training, I really learned how to be a much better educator. So I incorporate a lot of mindfulness in what I do as a coach, which doesn't mean that I sit around and tell 
overworked, over busy physicians that they have to meditate in time that they don't have. It's really more becoming the master of the mind rather than the captive. I know we'll talk about that a little bit more. Beautiful. And so you're working one-on-one -on -one with physicians, in groups of physicians. What is sort of the day-to-day, -day, what a doctor who's working with Gail Gazelle gets to experience? Right. Yes. It was really interesting over the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, you know, physician coaching kind of went to a halt, right? Nobody had time. People were terrified. People were on furlough, et cetera. And then as we progressed in the pandemic, really very tragically, my business moved which is good for me, but really it's a very sad testament to what's going on with burnout in healthcare. So I actually have a team of physician coaches who work with me, and we coach physicians to get them out of burnout, really to make them burnout proof. So for physicians that come to us for coaching, we have a lot of expertise. You know, between us, we have coached well over a thousand physicians. And I've really learned a methodology that I've seen be successful in the hundreds of physicians that I've coached. And that's the methodology that the coaches on my team use as well. So it's a very robust approach. I'm very active in the Harvard Institute of Coaching. We're looking closely at, well, what does it mean to coach physicians? You know, because physicians don't always know what coaching is all about. And there are a lot of coaches out there that do what I call the three T's. They teach, they tell, and they talk. And I've really mm -hmm. learned as a coach that if I listen, if I reflect, if I ask the right questions, if I put aside my bright expert physician mind and don't do those three T's, that's where I really see physicians stepping into their full autonomy and really reversing so much that we learn in training that only serves to fuel us uh, going into burnout. Gail, that's really, really interesting. The, the coaching, is it typically a set number of weeks or is it individual? Independent, uh, or do you have a program that people kind of go through? Right. It's a great question. I traditionally did a six-month coaching engagement with physician clients. That's fairly standard in physician coaching and coaching in general. And now what I do is I call up a busy physician 120-day mastermind. And it's really, I think people want results more quickly and six months can sound daunting. And really, if you're good at coaching, you get in there from day one and you really help people work with a lot of their own limiting beliefs, a lot of stories that they're telling themselves, not necessarily recognizing that they don't have to believe everything that their mind generates. And I can certainly share examples if that would be helpful. But I've really seen that when we get in there from day one and really align with the physician and engage with them in a transformative process, it's just amazing how much physicians can pivot, particularly burned out physicians can really pivot, staying in the same job in many cases and feeling much more satisfied in their careers, much more longevity in their careers. That's great. I mean, what one of the Things that Jordan and I share in our, in our passion and, and teaching that we've done is we try to keep physicians in the profession of medicine. There's a lot of people who yes. are trying to help people exit medicine, but I think we all agree it's a great field. It's a great profession. We just need to help each other and equip all of us really with some tools and uh, strategies. I think that's probably a good segue for your book, um, which you know we both found very, very easy to read. Um, and it's just filled with an incredible amount of wisdom, just really practical stuff that you can take and implement immediately. Maybe for the listeners, it would be helpful to maybe, you know, definition or maybe perspective on what exactly burnout is, and maybe what exactly mindfulness is, because those are the two really big pieces that you tackle in your book, Mindful MD. Yeah, let me start by saying if listeners want to download a free chapter, they can do so at gailgazelle.com forward slash mindful MD. And I suspect that your listeners are all too familiar with what burnout is. You know, it's really a tragic state of affairs that one in two of us, if not more, are walking around low town, you know, exhausted, cynical, and really disconnected, not just from our sense of meaning and purpose, but from our own sense of accomplishment. Because no matter how bad things are in your practice setting, each physician listening to this podcast is accomplishing a great deal. And yet, when we're in burnout, we almost have a kind of tunnel vision where we can't see any of the good within ourselves, in the people around us, or in our circumstances. 
In terms of mindfulness, it's so interesting because it's kind of become a little bit of a taboo word for physicians. Resilience is one of those words and mindfulness is another. Don't tell me to go meditate and do yoga and keep a gratitude journal. You think that's going to make everything better? We have to acknowledge that from the get-go. My book is not anything like that. It's really a roadmap to use this instrument that we all use in all of our waking hours, and yet we get very limited training in, and that is the human mind. Mindfulness is really about the awareness that develops when we pay very close attention to what's going on around us, but more importantly, what's going on within us. And again, I think in physician training, it's as if cognition is all powerful. We only learn about the good side of cognition, which is much, you know, incredible. And yet we don't realize that we don't have to believe all of our thoughts. We don't have to engage with all the stories and narratives that the mind is so good at spinning. And just to give you an example of that, you know, I describe in the book someone who I call Diana, an early career endocrinologist who came to coaching deeply frustrated with her career. She had gone into endocrinology because of the combination of the science and the humanity. And she'd be really fascinated. But not long into her career, she found herself really bored. The analysts, diabetics, obese patients, mild thyroid abnormalities, she just felt like she couldn't really use any of the science that had really drawn her to her field in the first place. After I empathized with her, because she was really downtrodden when she first came to see me, I asked her to tell me what goes on in your mind as you're going through your day, Diana. What kind of thoughts do you have? And she looked so down and she said, well, it's all boring, meaningless, and tedious. And I said, oh, wow, you know, that. what does that feel like when you have that thought? She said, well, I think it all day long. It comes into my mind endless times when I go in with a patient, when I'm sitting, you know, dictating charts, when I'm dealing with my MA. All I can think is this is boring, meaningless, and tedious. And it was so interesting because it was almost as if almost as if Diana's mind was broadcasting this message of just how bad things were. And again, after getting to know her, I challenged her and I said, Diana, you know, just tell me about any bright spot in your day, anything that went well with the patient. There was a big pause. She initially couldn't think of anything, but I pressed her on it. And all of a sudden, she started telling me about a patient who had come in, you know, whose A1C was high and the patient was feeling really desperate about it all. And Diana had sat with the patient and spent time with her and, you know, given her some more education about her diabetes. And they'd really connected. And as Diana told me about this positive patient experience, her whole affect shifted. Her face just brightened up. Her shoulders dropped. You know, it had, it was almost before that as if she were carrying this, you know, hundred pound gorilla on her back and she couldn't let it go. And this isn't to say that Diana started doing cartwheels, you know, when she went to work every day, but it is to say that her focus was really narrowed and she didn't understand that she could challenge the story that her mind was kind of holding her captive in. She was, you know, basically broadcasting this story over and over and over. This is bad. It's boring. It's tedious. It's it's just meaningless. And I found in the hundreds of physicians that I've coached that many times we can find ourselves trapped in a storyline. And these days, the storyline in healthcare is not exactly a rosy one, right? Combine that with the brain's negativity bias, which pulls us down, down, down into negative thoughts, judgments, worries, concerns, ruminations. You know, it's really a recipe for burnout. And we can talk more about this as well, but in the first part of my book, Mindful MD, the very short part of the book, I talk about what I consider to be the roots of burnout, how we learn in our training that, you know, it's very black and white. We're either perfect or a failure. We're the invulnerable captain of the team or we're some kind of weakling, right? We learn to be very harsh and judgmental with ourselves. We learn that we can be thrown under the bus if we miss one thing on a differential diagnosis, you know, as an intern or as a resident. And we really leave our training, I think, in in kind of a fear-based way of thinking. We feel like we have to prove ourselves. I've coached so many physicians struggling to get their charts done, and they really don't see their notes as medical documentation. They see their notes as proof of worth. In other words, that constant having to prove, and what if? I come up short. 
So that's a little bit about uh, the book and um, why I've seen it be really effective. Gail, thank you so much for sharing. And you've hit on so many nuggets that I want to double click on. The first of which is about Diana's story and how you helped her recognize just the sheer power of her presence with her patients. And that was in service of switching that mental story that she had been locked into. Can you tell us how you help folks cultivate presence through mindfulness in a healthcare environment that really prioritizes productivity and charting and all of these seeming barriers that interfere with one's ability to be present with our patients and ourselves? Well, I think one thing that's at the heart of what you're asking, Jordan, is we learn in our training that we can control everything. I mean, I was a hospice doc and why do patients come so late into hospice? You know, the average length of stay nationally is something like four to five days, which means that a lot of patients come onto hospice in their last 24 to 48 hours. And some of that is because we're taught that we can control diseases, even terminal diseases. So we hang on as a medical team, right? You know, the old joke about what does the oncologist do with the coffin? Well, they throw more chemotherapy in. And I'm not meaning to badmouth oncologists. I think it just reflects that we learn that somehow we are the ones in control. Mm -hmm. And what happens when we're in 2023, when well over 70% of us are now employees? And employees, by definition, have limited control over their workplace conditions, right? Whether they're a doctor or a janitor, it doesn't really matter. That's kind of the definition of being an employee. And we enter these workplaces and these healthcare systems thinking that we're the boss, we're the one in control. And it's very, very hard for us when we realize that it's actually perhaps a non-clinician administrator who's, you know, kind of got their hands on the reins of how things run. Mm. And so I think that's important. And I start that way with my clients, you know, who come to coaching very downtrodden. You know, I coach a lot of burnt out docs feeling like they can't go on in their careers some of them even self-harming, right? Very distraught that this isn't what they thought it was going to be and not knowing how to cope with all of the changes, uncertainty, unpredictability, and more. And so I challenged them early on, you know, gosh, what parts of this can you control? And what parts can't you? And I think that's a very pivotal question because when we're taught that we can control everything, we try to control everything. And we're very distressed when we cannot, right? And I've seen so many physicians, for example, sit down to chart and sit there thinking to themselves, this cannot stand. Mm. I didn't go into this career to sit at a computer. This is awful. How could they expect anybody to do this? And all very valid concerns, and yet it generates so much negative emotion that then it's no wonder that the physician can't actually focus and get the darn charts done. Absolutely. So I feel like it's really important to help physicians not give over their happiness to a broken healthcare system mm -hmm. and not let their emotions dissipate the very precious energy that they have, right? It's really hard being a physician, no matter what specialty you're in. You know, that's all the more true now in the post-COVID era. So we have to be very judicious about what we do with our energy stores because they are limited, not to mention that we might go home and have families that we actually want to be present with. And so to your question, Jordan, you know, all of this robs us of our ability to be present. When we're in fear-based thinking, when we're feeling like we have to prove ourselves, when we're feeling like we're never good enough, and when we're having a lot of challenging, negative emotions, it is very, very hard to be present. Present with patients, present with loved ones, present with ourselves. And it's a very important quality, and we can cultivate that quality of being present. We can cultivate our ability to work with our minds that are you know, producing tens of thousands of thoughts a day, many which are, you know, beyond fake news, you know? And that's what gets me really excited. These are skills that we can learn, and that's what mindfulness provides us, is that very mind training. 
that we're talking about here. I wish we had learned it in our medical training. I wouldn't have a job as a coach. I wouldn't be busy writing books if we had actually learned some of these very basic strategies because they are learnable. They really are. That's right. And I think where each of us here is on a quest to teach and to let the train the next generation of clinicians. I know this is my mission or one of mine to get these skills into the skills that we learn as physicians and even sooner as human beings in early life throughout elementary school and high school and well before we ever even decide to take on a role in a healing profession. I think without a doubt, right? Without a doubt. I'm thrilled that I was recently asked to do a series of workshops for the incoming class at my institution, Harvard Medical School. My book has gotten out, people are reading it, and it really could serve as a roadmap. So I'm very excited to be moving forward in that way because we do need to give give our trainees these skills early on. We can't afford it. We're losing so many doctors and the projected shortage of, you know, 120,000 physicians by, I think, 2025 to 2030. You know, this is a scary time in healthcare. And so we we have a duty to bring these skills as early on as we possibly can. I, I'm so delighted to hear that you will be teaching the incoming class. That is absolutely amazing. One of the One of the things you diagnose in the book is this idea, it straddles both the systemic and the individual factors that contribute to burnout, and that's this fixed medical mindset. And we've been alluding to it, but I would love if you can define that for us and talk about how this concept is coming up for physicians you work with. Well, we know about the fixed and growth mindsets from Carol Dweck's, you know, pivotal work on mindsets. And I think it's a very helpful frame because it's not that hard to notice when you're in a fixed mindset as opposed to growth. So fixed is very black and white thinking. It's I've done something wrong. I have failed. Growth is there's always opportunity to learn. If I've done something, it doesn't have to be deemed a failure. I can take away, well, what are the tidbits? And that idea has really been very important in my coaching of physicians. And so it's the fixed mindset, but add on that some of what we learn in our training. And we learn a very problem-focused lens. And it's very interesting because, of course, we have to be able to identify problems. That's what we do as physicians. We have to diagnose a problem if we have any hope of intervening and treating it. It's fairly basic. But unfortunately, we over-apply that problem-focused lens, and we find ourselves applying it to our relationships, Mm -hmm. to ourselves, to our children, and certainly to the world around us. And we, again, develop a kind of blinders where we can't see beyond that problem-focused lens. And so for your listeners even, well, what does that mean? You might be thinking, well, I don't know if I over-apply problem-focused lens, but If you just think a little bit about your personal relationships, you know, if you're married or if you have kids or just a friend or a community member, and you think about how you approach those relationships, I find within myself and with the physicians that I coach, all too often we're looking at everything as a problem. And guess who has to fix the problem? Well, we do. (laughs) <laughs> so instead of really seeing our relationships as the living, breathing partnerships that they are, we begin to think, well, gosh, how can I fix? How can I fix this other person? <laughs> how can I fix our marriage? You know what I mean? It, it, so it's overuse of that lens. And to me, that is the fixed medical mindset. It's a very problem-focused, deficit-focused lens. And I know for both of you, you've done so much, you know, to move the field of positive psychology into healthcare. It's just been incredible watching the two of you in action. You know what a problem it is when we get stuck in problems. (laughs) And yet that deficit model is really what we learn in our training. There's something wrong here. We have to figure out what that thing is. And And again, it's fantastic if we're looking at Lyme disease or we're, you know, trying to diagnose a malignancy or whatever the heck it is. But it really derails us when we apply it to everything and everyone, including ourselves. That's excellent. And I think, you know, one of the things that intrigues me about your book, Gail, and, and a lot of the work that, that you do is the, is the focus on understanding the mind. And, you know, some people would say the natural state of the mind is that problem focus, right? 
We're on the call is constantly searching for opportunities and threats out there. Um, you know, a survival kind of mechanism, maybe in overdrive for, for a lot of us. Can you kind of get a little bit into how you discovered that, you know, first of all, we are not our thoughts and, uh, and how to maybe create some distance between ourselves and mm-hmm. problem focused thought producing endless desire machine. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we can develop that distance. So I want to just start with that. The mind's job is to produce thoughts, thoughts upon thoughts upon thoughts. And in some ways, the mind is sometimes likened in a very unsavory manner to the salivary glands, which we need a saliva, but we all know what a problem it would be if we have too much. And in fact, not a good thing if we have too little. And I think it's a reasonable analogy because the mind is just busy producing thoughts. You know, it's estimated that the human mind produces between, I think, six and 20,000 thoughts a day. For physicians, it's probably closer to 50K. And that is a crazy number of thoughts in every waking moment, really is. And what we do with mindfulness is we become the observer of the mind. We pause and we pay attention, well, what's going on in my mind? And instead of being enmeshed with the thoughts, stories, emotions, and even physical sensations, we begin to create a little bit of distance so that we can become the observer of what's going in the mind. And the minute we do that, it's amazing what we see. I describe in the book as well a thoracic surgeon, I called him Brian, great guy, top of his game, you know, as a surgeon, but was sent to coaching because he was condescending and curt and rude. And that was the feedback that a number of nurses and his peers gave to his supervisor. And it was really interesting because Brian, you know, when when he was initially confronted with this information, he just thought, you know, ah, humbug. They, They don't know. They don't know all the good that I'm doing for my hospital. They're just a bunch of voices. And yet, when I tasked Brian with two weeks, of just paying attention to his thoughts. He actually called me in three days and he said, Gail, it's like a crazy town up there. I had no (laughs) idea what was going on in my own mind. And once he saw that, once he could observe it, in a sense, once he could diagnose his own mind, he realized that he didn't have to give all of those thoughts as much attention as he was. He realized that he had a choice. He could follow a thought and get caught in a thought of negativity, for example, or he could notice the thought and actually just let it pass by. And I think that's a really helpful takeaway. I often think about the the sky, the blue sky and the clouds, that we can imagine our thoughts being like the clouds. And clouds arise, they pass through the open sky, and then they dissipate, and they are no more. And all of our thoughts are simply transient mental events, right? You don't have to be a neuroscientist to know that. That's all they are. They arise, they travel through the open space of the human mind, and then they're gone. Every thought we've ever had, no matter how stormy it has seemed and all-consuming, right? It's some cat, some thought about some cat, 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 excuse me, some thought of a catastrophic nature. You know, your child, your teenager takes the car and goes to the mall. I'll be back in an hour, mom. And then they don't come back for three hours and you've got a lot of thoughts. Oh no, they had a car accident. This is awful. You know, I'm going to be called by the emergency department. And then of course they come home. They're fine. They were just out with their friends and they tell you, you know, that you're the worst worry ward in the neighborhood. We have a lot of thoughts that don't really make a lot of sense. Our mind is not necessarily a good predictor of what's going to happen in the future. And so when we can begin to observe the mind, there's so much power that comes from that, really. Because what ultimately do we have control over? Well, we don't have control over a lot of the messiness in healthcare. I wish we did. I so wish we did, but we don't. And I think that's abundantly clear when we really focus on it. And yet we have a lot of control over how we interact with others, how we work with our own mind, how we respond to each and every difficulty that we face. For me, 
That's what autonomy is about. And in the book as well, I quote Rich Ryan, who is the founder of the self-determination theory, our biggest and most widely respected theory about human motivation and growth. And he's written extensively about how mindfulness restores autonomy, no matter what difficulty you're facing. That is so helpful to hear. And it's a reminder that this book, while all physicians and probably all human beings on the planet need this for ourselves, this has been particularly helpful for me with patients and in my patient care. As a psychiatry resident, I'm working with patients every day, helping them to, trying to get them to be more curious about the way their minds work and what thoughts are coming in and how not to be so judgmental of the thoughts that they're having when they come in. And one of the most salient metaphors that I feel you use in the book that I've used not only for me, but with my patients recently is this idea of the two arrows. I'm wondering if you would be willing to express you know, in your words, what this metaphor is about and how we can apply it for ourselves and even those listening, maybe with patients when when this is relevant. Wonderful. So before I do that, I'll just say again that if people want to download a free chapter of the book, they can do so at gailgazelle.com forward slash mindful MD. So I'm so glad you brought this up, Jordan. I love actually sharing the concept of the two arrows of pain and suffering. Yeah. So basically, for any difficulty that we have, there are two arrows. The first arrow is the difficulty itself, what I would call kind of the facts of the matter. The second arrows, in a very different manner, are the ones that our mind creates that are pointed nowhere other than at ourselves. So in the book, I share the story of a physician that I call Isaiah an emergency physician who was on call one night, or not on call, it was on a shift that, that night, and somebody came in with abdominal pain, there was a CAT scan, and unfortunately, there was a misreading by the radiologist. Of course, the patient you know, went on, did okay, had to have a second surgery as a result of that missed finding, but the family decided to sue. And of course, they didn't just sue the radiologist. They sued Isaiah and the whole slew of clinicians. And Isaiah was a great physician, very well respected, top of his game. The first arrow was being sued. A very painful event, right? Kind of the worst fear that many physicians have in their career. So that's the first arrow, the facts of the matter. There was a lawsuit and Isaiah was named. But the second arrows were where Isaiah's mind went. And as I discuss in the book, they went in a lot of negative directions. He became filled with fear. And his mind told him that he was going to go down because of this. He was going to be vilified in the profession. Patients wouldn't want to see him. They would come to the emergency room and ask for somebody else. His mind told him he was going to be on the front page of his local paper named a deviant, a rogue, someone to stay away from. He started thinking that he wasn't going to be able to pay his bills. He would lose his job. He wouldn't be able to work. They'd be out on the street. He was so irritable that he wasn't sleeping. He wasn't listening with his daughter when they were sitting having dinner. He was even yelling at their new puppy every time she whined to go out, you know, to um, use the, the, the great outdoors. And he really was not at his best. So the first arrow, lawsuit, clear, painful event. The second arrows were where Isaiah's mind went. And again, because of the negativity bias, the second arrows usually take us in a very downward direction. They tell us all kinds of catastrophic stories, things that make it very difficult for us to actually cope with the real thing, the first arrow. And the more we can get to know our own second arrows, we can actually alleviate a lot of our own difficulties, a lot of our own pain and suffering. And I'll just say, I share in the book as well, my own stories, <laughs> my son, and, and he's comfortable with me sharing this. He developed Crohn's as a teenager. And that's the first arrow. Your son develops Crohn's. That's a bad thing that none of us want to have happen. We don't want our children to develop any kind of health problems, let alone, you know, chronic ones. But boy, the second arrows just went crazy. Second arrows that I was a bad mother, that I hadn't taken good enough care of him, 
that any other physician mom would have known to feed him the right food, that I was so selfish taking, you know, dealing with my academic career and I didn't cook him the right food. I didn't give him enough broccoli. <laughs> and those second arrows obviously were pointed nowhere other than myself. And I, I listened to them. I followed them for years. I thought I was to blame that somehow I had caused Davi's Crohn's. And I really had to spend a lot of time unpacking these second arrows, this mental story that I had of maternal guilt and wrongdoing. And I worked with them and I share in the book, you know, a whole protocol for how to work with those second arrows because we can. And it's a very important life skill for physicians as well as for others. I so appreciate you sharing not your patient stories, but your own experiences, as you just discussed with the second arrow or these second arrows. I think there's such a dearth of vulnerability within our field and especially more our esteemed mentors and more senior faculty who have been in the field really sharing when they have had self-doubt and Mm -hmm. imposterism. And I think you, it's so refreshing to hear just how Mm -hmm. honest you are at, you know, from where I'm standing, looking ahead at my career with your own experiences. I just don't think we have enough exemplars. I agree. I was coaching a neurosurgeon recently who's comparing mine, just told him that he wasn't measuring up. And, you know, we all know the medical hierarchy, right? You know, neurosurgeons way up there at the tippy top. Somehow we learned that, you know, kind of crazy that they're more worthy than some others, you know? And yet he was just so caught in second arrows. He'd had a a very minor complication, not even a major complication, no lawsuit. The patient ended up doing fine. And boy, he his mind went to town with those second arrows that other doctors knew more, other surgeons were better. What was wrong with him? He didn't stay up enough on the literature. And of course, we want to learn when we have a complication. We're all about learning as physicians. And we also need to stop undo pain and suffering that is only created by our own mind. And I'll just share one other thing. We haven't gotten to it, but it's the fifth way that I believe mindfulness restores autonomy and cures healthcare burnout. And I call that work with what is. And I'll just share this briefly. Just think back to, let's say when you were in high school and you knew you were college bound and you thought to yourself, wow, once I get into the right college, oh, then I'll be all set. But then you're in college and you want to go to medical school. Oh, I can't wait till I get into medical school. I mean, honestly, with an acceptance rate of, you know, four to six percent, you can start thinking that I'll be happy when I get into med school. Then you're in med school. And you know what? It isn't all that joyful. It's hard work. Right. And then you're in med school and you think, wow, OK, I'll be happy when I get the right residency residency, you're going through those years, and so many residents think to themselves, I only have to make it through residency, and then I'll be happy when I become an attending. And for those of you listening who are attendings, you kind of get that it just doesn't work that way, right? But it's a mental story that can preoccupy us and can steal away the happiness that we can find right here, right now, in all the moments of our lives, because why wait? You may not get that happiness. You may not get that rainbow, you know, much better to work with your mind and learn how to, again, just become the observer of these kind of mental stories, because the more you observe them, you can start seeing that they're factitious. They may have a kernel of truth, but they're not the whole story. Yeah, that's that's excellent. I mean, one of the things that we share um, a lot from positive psychology is this evolutionary wiring of hedonic adaptation where you get used to everything in your life that's constant. So this Great. I'll be happy when syndrome that you just described perfectly is is evolutionary wiring that's built in. You know, nature just wanted us to survive, didn't really care how happy we were along the way. And right. so our minds are not going to be content as a natural state. And they're always going to be, you know, prodding us to to do more, look, you know, look out be alert, all of that. So I think the the thing that you bring up in your book really perfectly is that we are not our evolutionary wiring. We are more than our thoughts. We are more than our mind. And, um, you know, I think that, that lesson, you know, I've been, I I think that in physicians for sure need to know that 
But I think, you know, there's a youth mental health epidemic. And, you know, applying some of the things in your book to families, I'm sure a lot of people listening have kids, you know, they're, they're struggling. And, and understanding that they don't need to believe every one of their thoughts, that a lot of their thoughts are just naturally garbage or, you know, meaningless in a lot of ways, uh, I think can, can offer a little bit of freedom. And so they're not so tied to their the sense of who they are by what their minds tell them. So much empowerment when we realize that. That's, that's what I hear you saying, not just obviously for physicians, not just in healthcare, but anybody who happens to have a human mind, which means all of us. So much empowerment that we can reclaim when we really learn what our minds are up to and, and the agency that we have there with. Again, you know, getting back to something you said earlier, Jordan, that what if we taught that to kids early on? You know, some of our the social emotional training programs that have been instituted and mindfulness programs in some elementary schools and some communities, what a gift to those children to really begin to gain that kind of mental mastery, which is what mindfulness is. It's not navel gazing. It's not just the monks sitting on the mountainside, you know, or mountaintop. It's for all of us to really have that true power that we all deserve to have. And it's there for us. That's what I've really seen over and over and over in the hundreds of clinicians that I've worked with. Mm. Since reading your book, Gail, it really inspired me to create more stillness, presence, mindfulness within myself. I have actually started doing <laughs> more of a meditation ritual. So five to 10 minutes a day, slowing down, trying to turn off all of the mental distraction. I find that I'm constantly listening to podcasts or, you know, news stories. And it's all in service of these thoughts that say, you know, like every minute counts, you know, don't fall behind. You got to stay up to date on the latest science and psychiatry and, you know, all of these things. So I, I'm beginning to really pay attention and recognize how I can implement some of these things for myself. I'm curious, you do recommend in your book that, at least in one of the stories, you recommended a daily dose of goodness for one of your clients, something that they could do every day for themselves. And perhaps as we close, I'm curious, what is it that you do for your daily dose of goodness? Yeah, you know, sometimes we physicians can almost be like, it's as if we're crossing the desert without a drop of water. Right. You know, we're not, we don't learn to take good care of ourselves. You know, many physicians don't even eat breakfast and then they wonder why they kind of have a slump before lunch. So I do recommend what I call the daily dose of goodness, something tiny to nourish yourself, to give you the sustenance you need to really face this marathon of a career. For myself, interestingly, it started with making myself a hot cup of herbal tea. That was my first daily dose of goodness. I, I really wasn't taking care of myself. You know, again, I was a solo parent, a busy academic career, busy hospice practice. I was writing articles. I, you know, kind of didn't even put myself on the list of priorities. And so it may sound so tiny having a hot cup of tea, but it was actually very symbolic. It helped me begin to nourish myself. I've expanded. You know, now I go for walks. And I really try to be outside in nature because I think most of us know how restorative nature is. But even if you're really busy in your practice, just going outside, just going to the door and looking outside or looking out a window can actually help your shoulders to drop and, you know, bring a little bit of calm into what is otherwise often a very hectic, frazzling day. So whether it's a cup of tea, whether it's listening to some nice music while you're doing your charting, for example, whether it's petting the dog, whistling a tune, <laughs> meditating, taking a hot bath, you know, spending a few minutes with a loved one, looking at nice pictures from a restful vacation. That's what each of your listeners deserves, you know, something that nourishes them. Again, that oxygen mask motif, I think, is very real. We can't keep taking care of others if we don't take care of ourselves. And again, I, I wish we had learned that in our training, but it's not too late to learn it now. Absolutely. Amen to that. Yes. This is Mindful MD. This is, we are here with Dr. Gail Gazelle. Six Waves Mindfulness Restores Your Autonomy and Cures Healthcare Burnout. 
You heard about a few of the ways today, but get the book and you can download her free chapter on her website to learn more and learn about all six burnout off ramp off ramps. Excuse me. So Dr. Gazelle, where can we find you? Well, again, my website is gailgazelle.com. You can also email me at info at gailgazelle.com. I answer every email that I get, and I, I would love to hear from some of your listeners what's been successful for them at getting them out of burnout, because we have to get one another and our colleagues and each of us out of burnout. That is right. Sand, any last questions or thoughts for Dr. Gazelle today? I would encourage everybody to get the book and not just read it for themselves, but read it for their families and start talking about some of these things with their own children. I've really done a deep dive into the mind of the last few years with kids, and it's hugely impactful to understand some of the stuff that, that Gail talks about in her book, Families. So thank you, Gail, for sharing. Oh, really a pleasure being with both of you today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you to Dr. Bradley Block for letting Sanj and I guest host this episode of Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.